The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's soldiers. But they themselves will not move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by men. For they make their philanthropies broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you all are brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you have one master, the Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions. Question one. What is the one word or phrase that captures all of today's readings for you? The one word or phrase that captures all of today's readings. Question two. Jesus says, call no one your father. You have one father who is in heaven. What are the implications of this teaching for you? How does it challenge the conduct of your daily life? What are the implications of this teaching to you? How does it challenge the conduct of your daily life? Question number three. Many churchgoers fit into Jesus' description of the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites. Discuss. Question number four. How would you begin to promote a new culture of leadership as humble service among your family members, friends, colleagues, and neighbors? Yes, sir. What is the one word or phrase that captures all of today's readings for you? For me, it is uh, leadership by example. Leadership by example. Because uh, in the first reading, prophet exercised the religious, lead, the religious leaders, priests, say that they do not teach the people, that they teach the people the right thing, but they don't uh, obey the relevant uh, things to teach. In the second reading, uh, the Apostle Paul you know, reminded the Thessalonians how they now not only they, they were nursing them like uh, babies, and they didn't uh, try to impose themselves on, the, on them, but assimilated themselves and show them the way to go on. And in the gospel too, Lord Jesus told the, the Pharisees, the people, 
that the Pharisees, that they should, uh, that they sit on the throne of uh, the Moses and preach what the Lord has said, but that they do not practice them, that they should do what they say, but not behave the way they do because they don't live according to God. So the hypocrisy in the Pharisees and scribes are the things that uh, is, are not right. So when we now say something, leadership should be able to leave out all the things we preach so that people can imitate us in the right way. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for him. I mean, if you're a leader and you do not lead by example, will the people follow you well? Will you have the moral courage to talk to the people? About having the moral courage to talk to those who follow us, there is this famous story of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. One day, one woman brought her child to Gandhi to plead with Gandhi to please talk to her child that the child was eating too much sugar. So when they came, Gandhi looked at the child and he told the woman, please go with your child. Come back in the next two weeks. They left. Two weeks later, they returned. And Gandhi took the child and told him, you know, sugar is not good. Don't eat too much of sugar. It is detrimental to your health. Then he went and told the woman, that's all. And the woman was like, what is the difference from last two weeks to now? If this is all you wanted to, why not just say it that time? And Gandhi told the woman, two weeks ago, I was eating plenty of sugar. So I will not have the moral courage to tell this little boy to stop eating sugar because myself, I was doing what? Glory to Jesus. Okay, next. Glory to God forevermore. Amen. I'd like to attempt question two. Um, Jesus says, call no one your father. You have one father who is in heaven. What are the implications of this teaching for you? I think for me, it stems from the fact of who a father is. And my understanding is that a father is a source. He gives identity. He protects. He gives confidence. He encourages you know, he charts the course of his children. And when Christ is saying, call no one father, but call, you know, the heavenly father your father, he was saying that only the heavenly father really is your source. He's the one that can actually define who you truly are. He's your provider. He's your protector. He's your shield. Oftentimes, people depend on human beings to do these things for them. And because human beings are limited, they cannot do everything. But calling God my father means that I have a source that never runs dry. Means that I have a protector that will always be there and available for me. Means that I have someone who has defined my identity beyond what any human being can understand or see. And how does this challenge the conduct of my life? Really, it means that I place my absolute trust in God in everything I do daily. And I put him first. You know, like Jeremiah says, curse is the man who places trust in man. Or blessed is the one who places trust in God. So I put my absolute trust in God. And being a father means I obey him. I defer to him. I do his will. So that's the implication of this for me. Okay. So a heavenly father is the one father that cannot fail us. Yes. Other fathers can fail, but he will never fail. Thank you very much. Let us put our hands together for him. Jesus, I want to add to question number one. But for me, in addition to what my brother said, I, our duty here to be honored but created God of God. This, this runs across three readings. First reading, the second reading, the gospel. And it was directed to teachers and priests, which all of us, by virtue of our baptism, have the duty 
want to corrupt the word of God, which is rampant is in many, many ways, both inside the church and in the social media, people are twisting the word of God to suit what they want, their own value. So it is for us to be watchful and mindful about the adulteration of the word of God to make sure that always that understand prepared to the true word of God, not the word of St. Paul. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for him. <laughs> One very important point that we all are, by virtue of our baptism, we are priests, prophets, and king. That is to say, we are all leaders. We are all leaders. Thank you. Yes, please. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to attend to and pray. Christ described many church viewers as Pharisees. We need to, I mean, I'll describe we need the way we behave and do things. Let me just take one aspect of life, the issue of forgiveness. Many of us, we like to come to the church, pray, even say our rosary, do everything, try to present ourselves as a good Christian. If we don't forgive even our neighbors. So we live a life that is contrary to what we preach and what we do. In that aspect, we are hypocrites. Thank you. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for him. We preach, but we do not practice. I mean, today is Sunday. And if you go out today, all the churches are packed full. We pray, we praise God, we hear the word of God. And we all, if you look at all these things, all of us are what? Are holy people. But when we go out tomorrow, what do we do at our various offices? What about all those things that we hear today, all those preachers that pre preaching that we hear today in church? Do we put them out? Do we leave them out? You know, there is this, there is this story of this young man who was interviewed by a journalist, a Christian, concerning the affairs of the country, and the young man was complaining bitterly about what was happening in the nation, that corruption is too rampant everywhere. And he, asked, he told the journalist, can you imagine, last night, someone came to my shop and bought goods worth 1,000 Naira, with fake 1,000 Naira notes. And the journalist asked him, where is the money? I have spent it. <laughs> the same thing we complain about, we do what? We preach, but we do not practice. Glory to Jesus. Yes, please. Glory to Jesus. Honor to Mary. Just to add to question three. Um, the hypocrite when we live a life of convenience. When we live? A life of convenience. Okay. So, um, because the journey of Christianity is not a life of convenience. But every now and then, we live a life of convenience. Just um, following what you just said, we leave the church and hear all the preachings and, and the mount, on, on the mountain, and immediately we, we come down from the mountain. What we practice is convenience, not um, following what just happened at the mountain. So it is just to look inward, really. If we really want to live this life of Christianity, to understand what Jesus is saying to us and find ways to adjust to the teachings on the mountain. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for him. I mean, if you are looking for a life of convenience, Christianity is the last place to look for that kind of life. Why? 
Because look at all the invitation that Jesus gives us. He says, anyone who desires to follow me must do what? Carry his cross and follow me. Is carrying crosses, is it convenient? It is not. So if you want to be a Christian, you must be ready to do what? To suffer. You must be ready to suffer, simple and short. Glory to Jesus. Yes, please. Glory to Jesus. I want to take question four. Uh, talking about leadership as humble service. Indeed, that, there is no better word for, for humble service. But in the life we live in, this world, see that we interpret it the other way. And that is why you find that leaders actually hypocrites. Because they lead, not in humble service, but they lead to a, a, amass wealth and oppress the people. So, you see, in practice, leadership is not humble service. Because if it were, everything will turn around. Now, I want to say that we are all leaders here. In this. We are all leaders, all of us, children, male, female, youth, elderly, and otherwise. Because leadership is about sacrificial life. Leadership is about living the word of God. Leadership is about reaching out to others in need. And in so doing, you endear yourself to them. They become good followers. So for me, how do I want to promote a new culture of Me, I will continue to live the word. Living the word means I will be there to make life better for people. Encouragement, assistance, caring. I will not run away from problems. Problems are meant to be solved. So, if I see problem around neighborhood in family, I will be there to lend a hand to solve the problem. Just like in like, just like in the office, just like in the market, we come together to solve our problem. That way, we we'll love ourselves and we we'll live a shiny, exemplary. And it will turn everything up. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for her. <laughs> Leadership is service. So, what we have today in our world is an aberration of what? Leadership. But that does not change the fact that leadership is service. Whether people who are in positions of leadership are servant leaders or not, leadership remains what? Remains service. Thank you. Glory to Jesus. Honor to Mary. I'd like to add to question three. For me, it's very worrisome, the dangerous dimension this hypocrisy is adding to the body of Christ. Oftentimes, you see, when you go around today, you see a lot of people speak very well, be them preachers, be them churchgoers, they preach very well, talk very well, but just a minute later, you see them doing the exact opposite. Now, as the year goes by, people are beginning to adjust to this hypocrisy. In fact, some will tell you, do as I say, not as I, I do. Now, for me, this is the greatest disservice, those who have been called to do this and chose to live this life has been doing to Christianity. Because I think that this contributed largely to the kind of Christianity we have today. As a person, and I know I speak the mind of so many people here, at one point or the other, you get discouraged about going to church just because of what these people do. We have people who are thieves. We have people who are prostitutes. We have people who do all sorts of things in the church. And I think it was instructive. That was why um, in that chapter, God was talking to the leaders of the church. And equally to us, let us understand that you might deceive everybody. You can deceive, but you can't deceive yourself and you can't deceive God. That whatever you do, at the end of the day, you will stand to gain your judgment. So, I think we should all be careful of these people and for us who desire to live the life of Christ, 
make sure we don't live like them and we can inspire the others. Thank you. Thank you. Let us put our hands together for him. Should I allow what I see in others deter me from going to church? Because I see that father, who is supposed to be an example, is doing the contrary. Is that enough for me to say, ah, if father is not even holy, what, then what am I looking for in church? Is that enough? Why? Because the ideal person is who? I am looking up to Jesus as my example. No human being is my glory to Jesus. Any other contribution? No other person. Okay, please. They're looking at question four. Uh, I want to say that uh, I want to look at it honesty and sincerity, even when honor and talent seem more important. That means recognizing that the gifts we have, our status, our position, our talent are from God. Once we begin to look at our gift as coming from God, we'll be humble. And I think that's the challenge that Nigerian leaders have. I, I came back yesterday from a, a meeting in Gombe, and we had the government functionaries staff conference. And for me, the challenge was that the entourage of the government, Entourage of deputy governor, number of policemen following one person. Challenging. Beautiful state, working very hard. But what is it? People won't even allow the leaders to walk. The accolades, the praise singing, and all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us put our hands together for him. I mean, part, part of humble service is that I am also, as a leader, humble in the way I use state resources. Is that also? But what do we find, find in our country today? The direct opposite. May God help us. Call no man your father on earth. How many kinds of fathers can you see in that picture? One is a biological father. And the other is what? A spiritual father. I mean, that child will grow up to call his biological father what? Father or daddy or papa or baba. All of them, they all mean the same thing. Father. And when he begins to come to church, how will he refer to the other? As father. But Jesus says, call no man your father on earth. How should we understand this saying? Is Jesus prohibiting the use of that title for our father or for our spiritual fathers? We're going to find out very soon. The gospel reading today begins in this way. It says, at that time, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. So who are Jesus' audience? Who was Jesus talking to? The crowds and his disciples. They are Jesus' audience. And who is he talking to them about? The scribes and the Pharisees. So who are the scribes? Who are the Pharisees? Scribe simply means one who writes. The scribes were trained to copy and interpret the scripture for the people. They were also the professional teachers of the law. They were experts in the law, that is the Torah. So the scribes are what we refer today as theologians, the theologians of our time. What about the Pharisees? The word Pharisee in Hebrew means separated ones. They were known for their strict observance of the law, ritual, piety, purity, and titan. They were very strict in their observance of the law. And they had plenty issues with Jesus because they felt Jesus was not as strict as they were. 
Remember at one occasion, they accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath. What did they do? They plucked grains of corn and they ate. For them, that was what? Walking on the Sabbath. On that occasion, they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath because he healed someone on the Sabbath. On another occasion, they also accused Jesus of not keeping to the ritual cleansing. You know, when before they eat, they wash their hands. And because Jesus did not wash his hands before eating, they accused him of breaking the law. So they were very strict. Also, they were faithful in paying their tithes. Very faithful. You remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Both of them went before God to pray. And when the Pharisee was praying, he said, I thank you, God, that I am not like. And one of the things he boasted of was what? I pay my. Was he lying? He was not lying. He, they were very faithful to pain of tithe. They were the most powerful and influential sects. There were many sects in Judaism at the time. We had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. But among them all, the Pharisees were the most powerful and the most influential. Majority of the Jewish people followed the teachings of the Pharisees. And Jesus himself attested to it. That is why today he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. Moses' seat, what does it mean? The seat of Moses refers to a ceremonial chair of honor in the synagogue where the authoritative teacher of the law sat. The seat of Moses is not explicitly mentioned in the Old Testament. Yet, it is referenced by Jesus to appeal to the teaching authority of the scribes and Pharisees. So, in the synagogue, the one who sits on the seat of, seat of Moses and interprets, that person is the authoritative teacher of the law. Obviously, because they also, they also teach the truth. If not, Jesus would have had issues with them. Jesus is telling the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, the, the crowds and his disciples, that the scribes and the Pharisees are the authoritative teachers of the Jewish people. They have to do whatever they tell them to do, but not what they do. Why? Because although they teach the law of God, they do not actually practice it themselves. The scribes and the Pharisees were examples of religious hypocrites. They know the truth. They teach the truth to others but they do not follow it themselves. Now, this reminds me what happens at every diaconate ordination. After the newly ordained are vested with their stole and with their dramatic, they go in the one by one to the bishop to receive the book of the gospel. And the, the bishop tells them, receive the gospel of Christ, whose errand you now are. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. And practice what you teach. There is no room for hypocrisy. It is very important that you first of all, believe what you read. Believe the gospel as the true word of God. And after believing, you teach what you believe. It is unfortunate that today, a lot of us, preachers, Pastors, priests, apostles, or whatever title we go with. We preach what we do not believe. Why? They tell you, uh, that is what the people want to hear. That is the one that the people want to hear. I mean, how is it possible to save some people by telling them lies? For you to be saved, it is important that you hear the truth and you accept the truth because Jesus says... Only the truth to do what? To set you free. And himself, he exemplified that. You remember John's Gospel, chapter 6, the bread of life discourse. While he was teaching the people, he told them, I'm the bread of life. Anyone who does not eat my body and drinks my blood will have no life in him. The people were offended. How can this man tell us to eat his body and drink his blood? Are we vampires? And the scripture says, on account of that, what happened? They stopped, many stopped following Jesus, including some of his disciples. But the interesting point is this. 
Jesus did not go after them to say, please come back. Uh, I was, maybe I was <laughs> saying something to you. Let me just, let me color it a little bit so that you accept. No. He left them to go. Why? Because you cannot save someone by lying to the person. It is only the truth that can set you free. So it is good that we practice, we, we, we preach what we believe to be the truth. And not only that, we also do what? We practice what we preach. Glory to Jesus. Jesus goes further. He provides examples of their wrong practices. He says, They bind heavy burden, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with their fingers. Binding heavy burdens. They teach what is very difficult and what should be binding on everyone. But they themselves do, do not make effort to practice or to observe what they have made compulsory for everyone to do what to observe. Now Jesus also attacks their, the, the, the motivation for, for what they do. He says that they do all their deeds to be seen by men. They were wrongly motivated. What did they do? Say, for they make their philanthropies broad and their fringes long. You know what philanthropies are? If you look at that picture, at the head of that man, there is a boss like thing on his forehead, and there's something that he ties on his arm. Now, the philanthropies are leather boxes, and inside that leather box is contained passages of the scripture. For instance, the Shema Adonai. Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all. So they put it into the compartment. Different passages of, of the scriptures, they put it into the compartment of the bus, and then they tie one on their head and one on their arms. It is supposed to be a sign of their inward disposition that they are dedicated to what? To God. Also, the, the fringes. The fringes are tassels that they wear at the bottom of their garments, at the bottom of their clothes. And the fringes are supposed to remind the people of the need for them to be committed to the commandments of, of God. Even Jesus himself wore fringes. Remember the story of Jesus' the Jesus encounter with the woman with the issue of blood. She told herself, if only I can touch the what? The fringes of his garment, I will be made well. Now, if Jesus himself wore fringes, what is his problem with the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, Jesus' critique is not against the practice of wearing philanthropies or fringes, but against the abuse of it. The Pharisees and the scribes made their, made their ass broad and long in order to be seen and praised by men. They made their own philanthropies to be what? Very broad. And their fringes very long, so that when people see them from afar, so that man must be very holy must be very dedicated to, to God. But in actual fact, were they? No. Their motive is just to be seen by men and to be praised by men. Now, concerning this, concerning the attitudes of the scribes and Pharisees, St. Augustine has this to say. He says, It is not the being seen of men that is wrong, but doing these things for the purpose of being seen of men. The problem with the hypocrites is his motivation. He does not want to be holy. He only wants to be seen to be what? Can you imagine that? I don't want to be holy. I just want people to see me to be what? He is more concerned with his reputation for righteousness than about actually becoming I don't want to be righteous. I just want people to know or to see me to be what? To be righteous. The approbation of men matters more to him than the approval of God. Now, Jesus goes further to point out other wrong practices that they love to do. Jesus says that they loved to have the best places at the banquet. They loved to have the best seats in the synagogue, that is the, the love positions of honor at occasions. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. They love to have people call them what? Rabbi, vainglory. The desire for title. 
I, I don't know if you have attended any ceremony or any function where they invite someone to come forward to sit on the high table. But the, the person is present, but the person refused to come forward. You know why? They refused to include the titles. They only said Mrs. Instead of Chief Dr. Mrs. The Chris for title. Now, Jesus' point thus far. He says, although the scribes and the Pharisees are legitimate teachers, they are hypocrites. Why? Because they don't practice what they preach. They carry out their religious practices with the wrong motive. They do all their deeds to be seen by men. They seek public praise. They are spiritually proud because they love public recognition and positions of honor. They are, in fact, bad leaders. Now, so far, Jesus has been pointing out some of the things that these people do that he does not want to see in, uh, in leaders. And then he makes that very important statement. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you have one master, who is what? The Christ. How should we understand this statement? Is Jesus saying we shouldn't call those that taught us in school, we shouldn't call them teachers? That's the meaning of rabbi, teacher. Is he saying that we shouldn't call our biological parents, father, on our spiritual leaders, fathers? Is he saying we shouldn't call our those who are placed ahead of us, masters, how should we understand this statement? The first thing we must know is that Jesus is making use of what we, we all know as what? Hyperbole. And you know what that means? When you exaggerate to do what? To make a point. And Jesus made use of this in so many places in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. For instance, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 29, Jesus says, If your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into. And if your right hand causes you to sin, you should do what? It is better to have one member of your body than to have your whole body thrown into. Are we to take that literally? Is Jesus saying that we should actually cut our hands or plug our eyes? No, he's exaggerating to make a point. The same thing in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 26. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciples. Are we to take this literally? Is Jesus preaching hate? No, he's exaggerating to prove a point. To tell us that the, our commitment to him must supersede what? The commitment we have for either father, brother, sister, or whatever. So Jesus is exaggerating here. Jesus is not saying that we should not call our parents parents, but he's exaggerating to prove a point. Now also, if we compare this saying of Jesus to other, the teachings of the early apostles, the writings of the early apostles, of the apostles we discovered that he was actually exaggerating and not being literal. Now, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, for though you have countless guards in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. If Jesus was prohibiting the use of the title, why is St. Paul referring, first of all, to all, you know, he told, he, he's telling the the church in Corinth, that although you have plenty gods, but you don't have plenty fathers. But me, I have become your father because I was the one who baptized you and I was the one who brought the, you know what, the good news to you. So the only thing, the only thing that makes sense is that Jesus was not pro literally prohibiting the use of the title. He was only, only exaggerating to prove a point. Also, if we are not too convinced with what St. Paul has said, what about what St. John says? Because John himself was present when Jesus made that statement. In 1 John chapter 2, John says, I'm writing to you fathers 
because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I mean, he referred to them as fathers. How many times? Twice. And he referred to the people as what? Dear children. If I call you my dear children, what does it imply? I mean, I'm your father. So if Jesus had prohibited the, the use of the title father, why would St. John be making use of the, of the title? The only thing that makes sense is that Jesus was exaggerating to prove what? To make a point. Now, in summary, when we interpret, call no man your father on earth, in the context of the entire New Testament, it is clear that Jesus is not prohibiting the use of the title father. Rather, he's only exaggerating to make a what? Make a point. Glory to Jesus. Now, after he pointed out all the things that the religious leaders were doing that were not good, for that reason he said, you shouldn't call them father because they are not living up to the title that they bear. Now he now you know, tells us what he expects of us as disciples, as people who are to be what? Leaders. He says, he who is greatest among you shall be your what? Yes. Whoever exalts himself will be what? And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The point of Jesus' exaggeration is to teach the crowd and his disciples something about good leadership, about servant leadership. What is implied in each of Jesus' statements is the servant leader, the good leader, should do the opposite of what the scribes and the Pharisees, what they did. That unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, good leaders should do what? Number two. Number three. Number four. Now, practice what they preach. Our brother at the beginning told us that we all are leaders. So this, this mandate is not only for preachers. It's not only for apostles or priests or pastors. It is for each and every one of us because by virtue of our baptism, we are priests, we are prophets, and we are... The greatest among you must be your servant. Leadership is service. Leadership is service. You see, the first and the most important decision that any leader will make is the decision to do what? To serve. Without that decision, that leader's ability to serve will be what? Will be limited. The first and the most important decision any leader will make before going into office is to do what? I must serve. If you do not make that decision, your capacity, your ability to serve will be limited. And it is unfortunate that today, a lot of us don't see leadership as opportunity to serve. We don't see leadership as service. Rather, we see leadership as an opportunity to amass wealth. Opportunity to do what? To grab power. Opportunity to do what? To become influential. And if we go into leadership with that kind of mindset, can we serve? We can't serve. So we must know ourselves. If you have that kind of wrong perception of leadership, you have nothing doing around the corridors of power. But when you see leadership as an opportunity to amass wealth, to become influential, to become powerful, when you get into office, you know what you do? You will destroy others and you will destroy yourself. You will destroy what people have spent their entire life trying to do what? Try to build. A good leader is the one who serves by building a human community in which the hungry are fed, the ignorant are taught, the homeless receive shelter, the sick are cared for, the distressed are consoled, and the oppressed are set free. When you remove service, leadership is what? Empty. What makes you a leader is your what? Service. 
The measure of a true leader is not how many servants he has. How many aids, as our brother rightly says, you gather aids to yourself. Not how many aids that you have. Or how many properties he has, he or he has acquired. In Maitama, in Asokoro, now in Guzape, or in Lagos. It is not about how many properties you have acquired for yourself. But how many people you do it, you serve. It is unfortunate that today what we see in our country is the moment somebody gets into leadership position, the first rumor you hear is that he has acquired one property in, in Maitama, another property in Guzape, another one in... It is not about how much you make for yourself because leadership is about the other and not about the self. Leaders lead by example. We are not to be like the scribes and Pharisees who lay heavy burdens on other people's shoulders without lifting a finger to move them. You remember what St. Paul says in the second reading? I know that you were poor. And in order not to become a burden to you, I had to labor for myself to support you. But what do we find today? Leaders preach sacrifice. They tell us that we need to make extraordinary sacrifice. But they themselves, are, made, are they making the sacrifice? When we were complaining about buying very expensive cars, you heard the recent one. And you ask yourself, what is happening? Are we mad? Is something really happening to us? What does the president need to ask for? May the Lord save us. Self-examination. I want us to read that first paragraph together. Can we? We can talk, we can go on and on and on, pointing fingers at politicians of pastors, of other leaders who have failed. But what about me as a priest? Am I faithful as a servant leader? Am I serving you? What about you as a father? What about you as a mother? What about you as a branch manager? In every capacity you find yourself, what about you? Are you like the same people that you're criticizing? If you're like them, what are you? Hypocrites. Our titles should remind us of our specific responsibilities in the society and our obligation to discharge them faithfully. Our titles should remind us of our specific responsibilities. We must accept those responsibilities and carry them out diligently. I don't know if you remember this song. In 2000 and 2006, there was this artist that you know, he sang a very popular song at that time where he called, you know, leaders should lead up to the title that they carry. African China is his name. He titles the, the song, Mr. President. Do you know that song? Yes. Mr. President, lead us well if you be governor. Lead us well. If you be senators. Senators well. If you be police. Police, police well, 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 no, they take bribe. Lead us well. Govern us well, if you be senator, senator. If you be police, police well, well, no, they take bribe. Whatever position of leadership you find yourself, just do your work well. Serve. And if each of us will serve, will accept the responsibility of the title that we parade around, today we have many honorables who are not honorable. Many excellencies who are not so what is the need of the title? Let us accept the title that we carry and do our work diligently. And may God help us. Amen. Scriptural passages for reflection. Work humbly with your God. That is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, who will do what? But those who do the will of my Father. In John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 12, Jesus washed 
his disciples' feet, exemplifying what? Servant leadership. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, death on the cross. James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord. God, our Father, we thank you for the gift of our lives and for the opportunity to hear your word once more. Your son reminds us today that the greatest of among, amongst us must be well, our servants. We pray that you may teach us humility, that you may raise up for our nation leaders who truly serve, and that each of us will also learn to lead by example. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us rise and profess our faith. I believe in one God. Our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us that true greatness consists in serving others in humility. Let us pray for the grace to be selfless and humble in our dealings with one another. For the clergy, That following the example of Christ, they may ever be willing to offer themselves the edification of all. Let us pray the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For our civil leaders, that they may recognize that the power they exercise is never to be used as a tool of oppression, but as an instrument to facilitate good of those who govern. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our For all medical practitioners and members of the armed forces, that as they serve to protect and care for life, they may be blessed with spiritual and temporal rewards. Let us pray to the Lord. For ourselves, that we may strive more to rid ourselves of pride and be given the grace to grow in humility and genuine love for one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the dead. especially those of our parish community and family members. 
that they may find eternal rest with the Lord. We pray, O Lord. Lord, grace. For the success of the evangelization and leadership development programs, the Luxterra Leadership Foundation, and for the intentions of its partners and benefactors. We pray, O Lord. Lord Let us now pray in silence for our own private intentions. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our Let us ask for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray. O oh Mary, full of grace. God and Father of all peoples, you never forsake your children in their needs. We humbly ask you to hear the prayers we have made to you in faith and grant that we may always be faithful to your teachings through Christ our Lord.